So the sermon text comes from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. John 6, 1 through 9. Hear now the inspired words of God. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs and how he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip. He had already knew what he was going to do. And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Twelve billion dollars. What could we do with twelve billion dollars? What could we buy with twelve billion dollars? Tickets. Lots and lots of tickets to superhero films. Seriously, I looked it up. $12 billion is how much humanity has spent in the past 10 years on super billion, superhero films. $12 billion. We love a good hero, don't we? Humanity always has, from uh, all the way back from Odysseus to Don Quixote to Iron Man. We love the hero who comes in to save the day against great odds, and, and we'll give our money to, for you to tell us a story about that. But you don't need to buy a ticket. You don't need to buy a ticket. It's not bad if you do, but you don't need to. Just pick up your Bible. The best superhero stories are here. And they're the best for a couple of reasons, I think, at least. First of all, because they're true. They're not just in the mind of some director or some comic book artist. They are true. These are the stories of real people who really lived. So I love them for that. Secondly, because these are not people that will never be. They're, they're not so great that we can just look at them and say, well, if only. All of the heroes in the Bible are ordinary people. They're people like me and people like you. They have their flaws. In fact, God loves calling people nobody else would expect. God loves to use people who everybody else writes off or discounts. So you don't have to be a certain age, either a certain age, you know, high or low, you know, below. Well, now you're disqualified. You're too old. Not with God. You don't have to be a great public speaker. Um, so if you have a fear of public speaking, speaking that's okay. You can still do it. Um, no gender, um, like you don't have to be a guy, you don't have to be a girl. God uses everybody, everybody. So I love that, that these are true stories. These are stories about ordinary people like you and me. And finally, these heroes changed the world. They changed people's lives. They had a deep impact, so deep we're still talking about them. And so I think about like, Think about some of the heroes God chose. There's this giant called Goliath, and all of the adult men in the army are like, heck no. And God calls David out, this little tween, and this little tween charges out to face down this giant while all the adults are afraid. No age, right? The youngest kids can be heroes for God. Um, you think about the other end of the spectrum. Moses had tried to lead this great revolutionary movement. When he was 40, he tried to start kind of an uprising, and he failed. And he kind of went into exile and had to be a shepherd. And at 80 years old, God speaks to him in a burning bush and says, you know that dream? It's time. And we think about, I think about Esther. She's one of my favorites. She was made queen. And right about that time, an enemy of God's people arose and was going to kill all of them with the king's blessing. And Esther, nobody knew that she was Jewish, and so she could have hidden. But she finds the faith to step forward. She's very cunning, and she saves her people. All of her people because she finds her voice. And then Paul. See, your past doesn't disqualify you either. 
Paul had been murdering Christians until Jesus shows up on the road to Damascus and Paul says, who are you? And Jesus says, I'm Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. Paul goes, oh no. And Jesus says, there's chance for you to become one of my greatest apostles. And he does. So there's all of these heroes with all these flaws and all these limitations that really rise up with God. And here's what I'm going to tell you. This is not just ancient history. God is raising up heroes today. And he's calling each and every one of us. And one of my favorite heroes can give us some good direction on how we can be heroes from God, for God today. And that's a little boy who's often obscured. Um, he's often just kind of a side, like a little footnote in the story. We don't know his name. We don't know how old he was. But we do know that without him, Jesus might not have been able to do one of his most amazing miracles. So it goes like this. You heard the story. Jesus began to be known as a worker of miracles, as a great teacher. And so people from all over the area started running to wherever he was. It didn't matter how remote he got, people followed him. And we understand that. We would do that too. So there's all of these people. He's teaching them on a hillside. And it's getting late. And the idea, especially in the other Gospels, we'll hear the disciples want to send them away to get food, right? So maybe they're even thinking that. But Jesus says he calls Philip. Now, Philip is a disciple that's kind of like the road manager. He was the guy who was in charge of all the food and all the supplies. Jesus was moving from town to town. So Philip is the one who organizes everything and makes sure that they have enough. And he says to Philip, Philip, not do we have enough money, not how do we do this, where can we buy bread for all of these people? Now, there were 5,000 men. That's how they counted in that day. How many men? That means there were at least 10 to 12,000 people. That's like more than the city of Bee Cave. Can you imagine the entire city of Bee Cave, let's put in Lakeway, sitting in the Galleria, overflowing everything, right? They're spilling out on the streets. And Jesus turns to you and says, where can we get enough food to feed everybody? And Philip says, oh. he's looking in the bag. He's looking at how much money he brought. He's looking at their provisions. And finally, he just, I'm just going to tell Jesus the truth. He says, Jesus, even if all of us, the disciples, worked for three months, for months and months every day, we would not have enough money to buy all of these thousands and thousands of people, one tiny bite of bread. This is impossible. This cannot be done. This is superhuman. Which is when our little hero steps in to say, well, I'll give you my dinner. Now, how did he know to do that? Well, he had three superpowers that we don't see in the rest of the crowd. Three superpowers that you and me, we can, we can work on getting. And the first thing is he had super hearing. So think about, think about him. He sat there. He's listened to Jesus. Maybe he's, he's listened when Jesus would uh, command someone to be well, to walk. He's been listening. And by super hearing, I don't mean he could hear when Jesus was a mile away. He could still hear him. But he knew how to use his ears to pay attention to what mattered. And so, as the formal teaching ends, and the crowd turns to listen to their neighbor or to talk to each other, to say, hey, do you have plans for the weekend? The little boy keeps listening to Jesus. We are superheroes when we are listening for God when nobody else is. Okay, that's how we can get super hearing. So we naturally, you're here this morning in part because you know God speaks through worship. So you're listening. And you pray because you know God will speak to you, maybe just an impression in your heart when you're praying. You go maybe to an Emmaus group or to a small group or to a Bible study because you know God speaks to you through those people, through the study. But we're heroes, we're super powered when we're listening for God, especially when nobody else is. So when is the last time you either went to like a professional sports game or you went to one of your kids' games and you were listening for God? Or going to the grocery store 
and you're still tuned in listening. What are you saying here, Jesus? Or you're stuck in traffic. We often talk about that, right? Everybody else is angry. You be the one who's listening for God because I promise you, God will speak to you. God is speaking. We have to be listening. Jesus was speaking. He was saying to his disciples, I want to feed everyone. There was one person who heard him. It was a little boy. He heard Jesus say, I want to feed thousands and thousands of people because he kept listening. Will you keep listening throughout your life? The second thing that this little boy had is he had super eyesight. And he couldn't punch through walls like with lasers or see through things, but he knew where to focus. Again, it's about focus. So imagine where the disciples are looking. They are looking in their bag and saying, we don't have enough money. They are looking at the crowd that's getting restless and saying, this is overwhelming. They're looking at resources. They're looking at problems. The crowd is getting restless. They're looking in their bags and saying, we don't have enough. They're looking around and saying, there's nowhere to eat. The little boy is not looking at problems or lack of resources. Where is he looking? He's looking at Jesus. And while the crowd and the disciples are seeing these great uh, problems, these great obstacles, this great lack of resources, he is seeing this great worker of miracles. Oh, this is the guy who helps the lame to walk. This is the guy who, if you're dying and the doctors say there's no hope, he'll heal you. And this is the person who I just said, heard say he wants to feed everybody. So, the, the little boy is looking at Jesus who works miracles, not at the problem, not at the lack of resources. He's fixing his eye on the Savior. Our lives will change when we simply learn to have supervision, to look at Jesus no matter what is raging around us, no matter what problems are coming against us, no matter what everybody else says the odds are and that they're really bad, we are fixing our eyes on Jesus and saying, oh, but he works miracles. And he's right here. And so the little boy looks down at what he has, and this is his last superpower. He shares all of it. Okay, five loaves of bread and two fish. And as I think about that, I think he probably wasn't there alone, right? This is the picnic his mom prepared. And without noticing it, this little boy goes up, takes the whole family's food and is like, here, Jesus. Can't you see the mom going, no, that's our food. But he had hands that share and that share generously, that share abundantly without holding back saying, here, take it all. It's a dinner, but take it all. And Jesus does take that small dinner, that offering, and he breaks the bread, and as it leaves his hands, it does what it never could have done if it left our hands. It's multiplied. And we hear in this story that not only did everybody get a small bite, but then they got a bigger bite, and they got so much that they were stuffed, and they gathered up baskets and baskets of leftovers. And so when we have hands that share, instead of saying, oh my gosh, there's 5,000 people that need food and I have five loaves and so I'll just try to make this happen. If we can give it to Jesus, then it's up to him to work the miracle. It's up to him to take what we offer and to just multiply it. And I promise you, God is still in the business of working those miracles. Jesus is still in our midst saying, I'm longing to transform all of these situations into something from something that's really hard to something that's miraculously good. If we can just hear and see and give. And so just like that little boy saw possibilities, our church sees possibilities. Uh, this is the time of year we start dreaming about what's to come and I'm dreaming and I hope you'll dream with me. Next year is all about vitality and that just means strengthening what we have. So I have a dream that as strong as our children's program is, it would be even stronger next year. We would just reach, gosh, could we reach 100 more kids? Could we tell them that Jesus loves them? Could we help them serve? Could we do that with our youth? 
just double the program size. Because we have like 100 kids that we reach. Could we reach two dozen more youth? Could we help them live out their faith in their high school or in their middle school? Could we take them on mission trips to serve alongside of us? Could we help them get ready for being adults in this world? I have a dream of that for each of us that are adults too. My dream is that by the end of next year, each of you would be in some kind of an Emmaus group or a small group or a Bible study or a service group somewhere where there are six to seven other people who know your name. If, you're not, if you don't have that already, that's my prayer for you. That's my dream, that you have this little smaller community which, within this larger church where people know you and they love you. And if you're missing, they're going to call you and say, are you okay? I dream that for you. I, dream, I have a big dream about our budget. Uh, we carry old debt. This is debt from before I came here. This is debt from 2006 when we built this sanctuary here. Old debt. You want to hear the good news? It's not $12 billion. That's the good news. And we haven't added to it at all. In fact, we've been wailing on it. We're, we could pay it off in seven years instead of 15, but y'all, that's seven years. And it's $800,000, just the debt from this this sanctuary, that means that every year you're giving, my giving, our giving, $140,000 of it goes to principal and interest on debt. I'm sick of it. I'm longing for the day when every single dollar you give is directly into ministry. And I feel like we can pay that debt off earlier than those seven years, earlier even, get rid of it, and then be able to do $140,000 more of good in this world to change that many more lives. Yeah, amen. Let's get rid of the debt, right? Yes, let's do it, let's do it. Okay, that's the dream. How does it happen? Well, it happens when all of us do what we can. When all of us do what we can. And then we let Jesus do what only Jesus can do. Right? We're, we're not, we don't have to work miracles. We just have to listen and watch and give so that Jesus can work a miracle. And as I pray, I pray for our church all the time. I walk through around the campus and I pray and I walk in my neighborhood and I pray at home and the thing that, that God is saying to me is, get ready. Because as great as the miracles in the past have been, God is ready to do even greater things in and through us in the future. And that's exciting, you guys, because we have seen miracles. I mean, 16 years ago, this church did not exist. And now we're 600 people strong. And it was a, what, what's called a parachute drop. They just dropped a pastor in. Those things never work. That model, never, people say, don't do that. It worked here. It's a miracle. Right? We had somebody outside of our church when we first started building who gave us this land. This land. That's a miracle, right? That's a miracle. We, we've had somebody else who offered a million dollars so that we could get started on a gym and multi-use building. And we got together, and I know, I kind of knew you don't like debt because the congregation said, well, I, we'd like to build something bigger than a million dollars, and we'd like it to be $2.5 million, but we don't want to have any debt on that building when we're done. Okay. And we also don't want a capital campaign. Okay. That sounds impossible, but it was, we were watching, and we were hearing, and we were giving what we could to God, and we did it. We did it. We built an entire new place for our community, for our kids, without adding to debt, without a capital campaign. Every church I talk to says, that's just impossible. I say, it's not. It's not impossible. We have a great God. I have generous people. It's not impossible. I think about how right now we have a worship service offsite at a distillery. It's led by lay people. That's ordinary people, right? They're not ordained by me, like me. Um, we just sent them out. There are 50 to 60 people there who are coming to faith in Christ because of that service. And everybody told me, that can't be done. It's done. 
We are a congregation where we saw long ago that we were giving 1% beyond our walls to outreach, to teaching people about Jesus, to changing lives. And we said, gosh, it's just in our hearts that we could do more. We didn't know how, but we wanted to tithe. And so everybody told us, well, that, I don't know if you can do that. There aren't churches, there are a handful of churches that do it. We do it. That's a miracle. Just this year, you guys, because of all of this, just this year, 13 people have come to faith in Christ through our ministry. 13 people are part of God's family because you loved them and you hugged them and our ministries touched them. And I have this dream that next year it could be 26. I just have this crazy dream that there's even more to be done and God is confirming that there are greater things to come. There are greater things still to be done. There are greater miracles to witness. The miracles of God are not over. They're not ancient history. They are happening. They have been happening. They will be happening. And God is calling each of us. So think about it. God, with Goliath, God could have sent a bolt of lightning to strike him dead, right? Done. But God is inviting David to stand up against him. God could have opened up the earth and swallowed Haman, but God is inviting Esther to find her voice, right? Jesus could have just made bread out of nothing, but he is inviting a little boy to come up and give his dinner. In the same way, God is inviting us to be part of this holy, amazing partnership. That there are things that Jesus wants to do that if we don't act, I don't know. He'll find a way, but he's inviting us. And I don't want to, I don't want to miss out on that. Because with one little supper, Jesus was able to feed 5,000, 10,000, 12,000, right? And still today, he's working miracles. But he needs heroes to be part of that partnership. And he's calling us. Are you ready? Let's pray. God, we are so ready um, for the scary and wonderful and exciting miracles that you have ahead for us. We are so deeply grateful to be able to see you moving in our church, in our community, in the lives that have been changed uh, when they got to know you. We are so excited to get to just be part of something that matters so deeply. Help us to not be afraid, to not Listen to the crowd, to not listen to the doubters, to not look anywhere but you, to look at you. And Lord, help us to do what each of us can and then do what only you can. And may there be miracles of multiplication of more than enough of changed lives even today. We are ready, Lord. And we say that you have us and we're looking forward to what you have in store.